Welcome to today's discussion of Spain in Texas during the 1700s or the 18th century. And specifically in this lecture, we'll be looking at the period 1690 to 1779. And the subsequent lecture will look at the period after 1779 until Spain left Texas, um, went after and Mexico declared and won a war for independence against Spain. Now, first of all, let's look at <clears throat> the efforts of both the state of Spain and the Catholic Church to establish a colony among the Caddo in East Texas in 1690. And the principal players in this effort were the Spanish governor Alfonso de Leon, who was the governor not of Texas, but of a Spanish area south of the Rio Grande in what's now Mexico, and the Franciscan priest or father Damien Massanet. Now for his part, Governor de Leon really wanted to set up military posts. You'll recall those are called presidios to keep the French away. We saw in the last lecture that the Spanish wanted to use Texas as a buffer area to have control there to keep the French from moving towards Mexico and of course Mexico with its wealthy silver mines. Now for his part, Father Massanet really wanted to focus, as ex you'd expect, on converting the Indians to Catholicism. And so he wanted just a few soldiers there, but he wanted the vast majority of the people to settle, that settle in the colony among the Caddo to be associated with his mission. So there was a, a fundamental dis, disagreement among these two about the relative role and number of Spanish soldiers and missionaries that would remain in East Texas. <clears throat> so in 1691, uh, Tehran became the first appointed governor of Texas. Texas, of course, being a part of the Spanish Empire. And Tehran had an expedition and he started eight further missions. Now the Caddo really preferred commercial ties with the Spanish rather than being converted to Catholicism. And you will recall that the French policy in North America was not to really convert the Indians to Catholicism because the French at this time were uh, uh, Catholic, well, still are Catholic, but Catholic. But the French would move in and not really establish colonies, but trade with the Indians. And the Caddo's had been trading with the French. So the Spanish effort to set, set up a mission collapsed within a few years in 1694. And let's look at why. <clears throat> well, the Caddo lived in an area with a lot of rain in the forests of eastern Texas. There were a lot of animals. There were rivers with fish. So they simply did not need to depend on the Spanish missions for food, for survival. In contrast, as we'll see a few minutes, the Indians in the area around San Antonio often wanted to go and live in the missions because while they were living there and learning skills, learning Spanish and um, converting to Catholicism, they received food and they're, you know, anyone who's been to the San Antonio area, area knows it's quite arid. So the Caddo's just did, also didn't want to live in the missions. They were quite happy living their traditional way. And in terms of theology, the Caddo's had great difficulty accepting some fundamental Christian and concepts, especially baptism, the idea that someone is born with an original sin and it has to be washed away in a religious ceremony, nor could they accept that Jesus Christ was born to a virgin. They just could not accept that. In contrast, the Caddo's wanted to trade. 
and they wanted to trade for guns because the French gave guns and ammunition to the Indians wherever they traded and as well as uh, cloth and metal objects such as uh, axes, knives, and uh, metal cooking pots. Well, the Spanish prohibited trading guns to the Indians, and the Caddo very much wanted guns, both for hunting and for defense against other Indian tribes. <clears throat> now let's look at Spanish occupation, permanent colonization in Central and East Texas. Now the Caddo, of course, are in East Texas. As we saw before, until around 1710, 1720, Spanish efforts north of what is now Mexico really focused on uh, the state, what's now the state of New Mexico. Spain and France, meanwhile, were competing for control of the coastal areas of Florida and the Mississippi Delta, where France managed to establish the city of New Orleans. Well, once the Spanish missions collapsed in the Caddo region, the Caddo immediately turned again to commercial relations with the French in the huge French area called Louisiana. And we'll see in a map in a minute, don't think of Louisiana as the size of the current state. At this time, Louisiana referred to the area all the way from the current state of Louisiana all the way through the central part of the United States up and into Canada. So it was really a huge area. And by the 1710s, by, by about 1720, the French traders were actively trading with the Caddo in East Texas. Now, Saint-Denis was French, and he and the French traders hoped that they could get the Spanish missionaries to help them trade with the Caddo's, and so they reached out to get their assistance. Well, as part of this effort, uh, Mr. Saint-Denis traveled to Texas, which of course was under Spanish control, he was arrested and he was taken to Mexico City and eventually the Spanish agreed to have a partnership in East Texas. Now, San Dani uh, established six new missions in East Texas with Spanish soldiers. Now let's move westward to the area uh, around San Antonio. Well, the East Texas missions, for a variety of reasons, and you can read the details in the textbook, they again started to decline around 1715 or 1720. And so the Spanish established several missions along the coast, very small missions, and military posts or presidios. <clears throat> well, the retreat of the Spaniards from East Texas led to the growth of San Antonio, which became by far the largest Spanish city in Texas. And while Spain, uh, San Antonio was growing, Spain again in the 1720s went and tried to start missions in East Texas. And those missions would be aided by the substantial population in San Antonio. So here we have a, di uh, a map uh, showing most of the Spanish missions during this period. I've circled in red what is clearly the most famous, the Alamo, uh, which was established in 1718, and it was formerly known as San Antonio de Valero, and I've circled that in red, and of course, uh, we'll talk about that a lot more when we get to the Texas Revolution, but that's in uh, San Antonio. But in total, the Spanish established 35 missions in Texas. And you can see in this map, there were virtu virtually none in the very northern part of what's now Texas. Now in San Antonio, 
they established a mission um, called Mission San Jose. It's also called San Miguel de Aguayo, who was the governor. And this was founded in 1720 in San Antonio. And this is a photo of what it looks like today. There is a good video in the module of the five uh, existing missions in San Antonio, which are part actually of a U.S. national park. And it's a great long day trip from Houston area or you know a one night trip. And it's well worth it if you haven't done it. Now let's look at this church. Let's go to the side and look at the famous window. This is known as the rose window because it's somewhat shaped like a rose. And it's uh, considered, uh, for this time period, a, a work of a Spanish masterpiece. And this is a portrait of uh, Governor... Aguayo, and like all portraits until very recently in history, everybody looks very grim, nobody ever smiles, and um, so this is his formal portrait. The Spanish also uh, built a mission in La Bahia, and they moved it from near the coast closer to San Antonio a few years later. And you can see it's a very substantial mission with a wall going around. Now let's talk a bit about Governor Aguayo. Next step in the Spanish attempted colonization of the state was Aguayo set off with 500 men and by far the largest Spanish expedition. And again, they returned to East Texas to the Caddo. And the Caddo at this point were both in Texas, which belonged to Spain, and they were also in Louisiana, which belonged to the French. So Governor Guayo and his soldiers expelled the French, and once again, they restored the Caddo missions. This is, we'll see this several times. There's a cycle of the Spanish leaving the Caddo missions and then going back and reestablishing them. This is a map from the time of the Aguayo expedition to East Texas. Uh, this map actually is in French, but you can see there the Gulf of um, Mexico. You can see where Houston is. Uh, there wasn't much going on at this time near where Houston is. And then up in East Texas, uh, the area of the Cato. Well, returning to San Antonio, Aguayo supervised the construction of both presidios or military outposts and missions near San Antonio. And the reason he, he focused on the area near San Antonio was because of the rivers and the good source of water there, which they needed for agriculture. And we'll see in a few minutes for ranching. And he moved down to the coastal in, Indians. And we saw a few moments ago a photo of La Bahia which was a mission with a presidio nearby. And then that was located to what's now the city of Goliad, closer to San Antonio. Well, these presidios or military posts were very expensive to run and they never really received sufficient funding from the Spanish center in Mexico City. Uh, as I mentioned previously in another lecture, for the Spanish, Texas was on the very edge of the Spanish Empire. They had hoped uh, to find gold or silver or other riches, and they hadn't found anything. And, and so there was a lot of tension here now between the soldiers uh, because they, their military establishments didn't receive enough money and the local missions, which oftentimes received more money and uh, from the church. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the Caddo in East Texas greatly preferred trade over mission activity. Now, in contrast, the poor Quatetecans tribe, which we looked at in an earlier lecture, which is located in central and coastal Texas, they were much more receptive to life on Spanish missions, primarily because they were much poorer the areas they lived in 
they really didn't have many animal resources. There was little rainfall. And by going to the missions, they could um, obtain adequate food. Let's spend a moment looking at the purpose of missions in general. The purpose of missions was not simply to convert the Indians to Christianity. Rather, the purpose, the overall purpose of a mission was to turn the Indians into loyal Spanish subjects because wherever the Spanish established missions, whether it was in Texas, uh, California, or in Mexico itself, was now Mexico, the purpose was to, to make these Indians uh, Spanish subjects. So there were three main elements. First and the most obvious was to convert the Indians to Catholicism and to baptize them. And the Spanish kept very detailed records of how many Indians were baptized. They were required to attend the Catholic Mass on a regular basis. Also, a major effort was made to teach the Spanish language to the Indians, well, particularly when you're dealing with a lot of different Indian groups with different languages. This was a practical necessity because the Franciscan priests certainly could not teach, understand all these languages enough to teach Catholicism. So a great effort was made in uh, forcing them to learn the Spanish language. And the third element, which is often overlooked, is the made, one of the three major purposes of a mission was to train the Indians in practical skills so they would have an income and, would have, and they could be taxed because Spain was looking at this in the long term with all these Indians there, wanted to make them productive and then they could pay tax revenue, they could pay taxes to the Spanish state. By practical skills, we meant things like making cloth, weaving, carpentry, becoming a skilled carpenter or, or a mason and, and uh, laying bricks, farming, learning, teaching them how to put up fences, effective and inexpensive fences, and simple irrigation fields at a time when there obviously weren't any electric pumps, but they still could teach them how to build channels from a, a river and the proper way to plow fields so the irrigation water was best used. And an, another and somewhat related area was ranching. There were now many, many wild horses and wild cattle, particularly in southern and central, southern Texas and up to about San Antonio, Austin area. So the Indians were taught how to ride horses and how to do the basic skills we now associate with um, cowboys. And the Indians who learned these skills were called vaqueros because the word vaca in Spanish means cow and so they were called vaqueros. We'll talk a little more about this in a subsequent lecture. And this was really the foundation of the famous Texas Cowboys. It started among Indians who were trained by uh, the Spaniards. And the last point in this slide is various expeditions to Texas had taken hundreds and sometimes thousands of cattle to Texas and let them graze, you know, to fatten them up, to reproduce. And this was the basis of the very early ranching industry in Texas, which we'll see up through virtually all of this course. Now, as I just mentioned, the Spanish settlements concentrated in central Texas in the San Antonio uh, area. The population of San Antonio was growing rapidly because of Spanish soldiers and missionaries. And the rest of Spanish Texas didn't really grow as fast. Some areas declined in population, population here of Spanish-speaking people. And you'll recall from the earlier lecture on the Indian groupings in Texas that 
Licado in East Texas had a conflict with the Apaches in West Texas who were coming down also and attacking the trading partners of the Caddo. And this included Apaches attacking the Spanish and the Apaches in particular would raid Spanish ranches and settlements to steal the horses. <clears throat> well, of far greater and lasting importance was the Comanche tribe of Indians. They, in the 1600s, they were up in Wyoming, Colorado area, and then by about 1700, they had moved down um, into southern Colorado and bits of New Mexico. But during the 1700s and late 1700s and early 1800s, they moved into virtually all of central Texas, northern Texas, much of the states of Oklahoma and Kansas. And these Comanche were just experts on horseback, particularly fighting. Many of them had rifles. They had attained, obtained the rifles by trading with the French. They were expert shots. They would, um, actually one way they would earn money is they would um, attack tribes of India, other tribes of Indians, take prisoners and sell those uh, Indian prisoners as slaves to other Indian groups who would keep them. And the word Comanche comes from the Ute Indian word that means anyone who wants to fight me all the time. They just were feared by all the other Indian tribes. Not that the other Indian tribes were totally peaceful, but the Comanches were fearsome and very effective warriors who could use the horse much better than any other Indian tribe. And in fact, the Comanches were so successful in, uh, and so feared in central Texas that they prevented the Spanish, the Mexicans, and even the U.S. Army from moving into central Texas until almost 1900. Uh, this is the map that shows what I just mentioned. You can see in the 1600s, the Comanche were up in uh, Wyoming area. They moved down into Colorado. And then they moved down into much of Texas, uh, right around San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, that whole area, uh, north and northeast, that was called now the Texas Hill Country. Uh, and this was uh, the area really controlled by the Comanche and if anyone wanted to travel through there, whether they were Spaniards, the Mexicans when this was part of Mexico, or later people from the Republic of Texas or later the United States, uh, they would travel only in heavily armed uh, groupings. <clears throat> so let's look quickly at the 1740s and 1760s, the 20 year period where San Antonio was really the only significant population center for Spanish speaking people in Texas. Uh, there was a Spanish mission in San Saba, uh, northwest of San Antonio. There was a church mission and a small military out, outpost, but uh, that was right in the heart of Comanche territory and the Comanches essentially destroyed it by about 1750. There were also some missions in East Texas near the coast that just were not productive and they were abandoned. Uh, this map shows what I was just mentioning. You can see in the center San Antonio circled in red and to the northwest of that you can see the San Saba mission which was taken over and destroyed. Uh, by the Comanches. And to the east of San Antonio, uh, you can see some of the coastal missions that were set up in the 1750s along the lower part of the Trinity River. And those were just not successful and were abandoned. This is a Spanish uh, drawing from the time. Um, 
or painting rather, and this shows the destru destruction of Mission San Saba, and you can see the protection there that the uh, Spanish mission had was a, a fence made of tree trunks, and you can see the uh, in this depiction the Indians coming in. <clears throat> now Spain still remained focused on New Mexico. And during this 20-year period, it established 20 new towns and 18 missions. And only a couple of those were in what's now Texas. So once again, we see San Antonio continuing to grow. Now it has about a thousand Spanish-speaking settlers. But other com communities were very small and economically of very little or no value to the Spanish Empire by the 1760s. And I've indicated here in, in, in blue a point that runs through the Spanish colonization of Texas, and that is Texas was just a frontier. There was no wealth found there, no mineral wealth. Uh, people thought it was generally too dry for productive agriculture. And it was an opportunity for missions, for Catholic priests to go out and uh, try and uh, convert the Indians, and of great importance for the for the Spanish, and which will change shortly, is it was a a buffer state between Spanish Mexico and French Louisiana, because the real fear was the French would come down through Texas into Mexico and uh, uh, attack the wealthy silver areas in Mexico. <clears throat> well, Texas's value as a buffer between France and Spain ended when France was defeated in 1763. In this, uh, and it was the settlement in the uh, French and Indian War, as it's known in the United States. In Europe, it's called the Seven Years' War. This was a global war. And this, the result was the huge French territory of Louisiana went to the Spanish. And the net result was Texas was no longer so valuable to the Spanish because they didn't need a buffer uh, to keep the French out. Uh, this map shows the situation before 1763. You can see how huge Louisiana is there in green. And right to the left of it or the west of it, you can see New Spain. Uh, you can see, so uh, this is the situation. There were, and I must emphasize, in the French area, there were very, very few French settlers there were a few people who had stores and whatnot, but it was mainly French traders who would go out, give guns and other manufactured products to the Indians and, and receive uh, animal skins and other products that the Indians would offer. Now let's look at the situation. This map is a little later from 1810, but it makes the same point. You can see now in the yellowish color the uh, Spanish territory, and you can see right in the upper middle part of the map, Spanish Louisiana. Look at how huge that is. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's much larger than the current state of Louisiana. It goes way up into what's now Canada. It, it basically on the east, or on your right as looking at the map, is the Mississippi River, and it goes all the way over um, to the Rocky Mountains. It's very, very huge. And you can see to the south of that, Texas. So when Spain controls Louisiana, Texas is of much, much less value. And also Spain controls, of course, Florida. <clears throat> so Spain now controls this huge territory in, in North America. It obtained Louisiana from the French. Well, what should it do with it? Well, and it, apart from that, Spain has a lot of territory 
in North America, extending all the way to the Pacific Ocean. It has what's now California and Oregon, Colorado, that whole, whole area. What's it supposed to do with that? And the Spanish Empire in what's now Mexico is centered, of course, in Mexico City, but then in the silver producing areas to the north of it. Well, a gentleman by the name of Ruby led a survey and he was asked by the Spanish to go out and evaluate the cost and value of setting up missions and military establishments and presidios in all the Spanish territory in the north from California over through Texas. <clears throat> well, Ruby's report really found nothing positive about East Texas. He said he saw little value in going to East Texas. Very few Caddo had been baptized in recent years. And, but he did, and, and he said, we don't need to have military missions there because the French are no longer nearby, so we, we don't need to worry about that. But Ruby did suggest increased support for the missions in San Antonio and Goliad, which is a city near uh, San Antonio. He also recommended closing a number of missions, said there were too many, and uh, attempt to expel the Apaches and particularly the Comanches. Well, that's easier said than done because as we looked at a few minutes ago, the Comanches were fabulous warriors on horseback and so the Spanish were not able to expel them, uh, nor were the Mexicans, and in fact, nor were, was the U.S. Army able to do that uh, for many years. And in general, with all the other Indians, other than the Apaches and Comanches, who we wanted basically expelled out of the Spanish area, uh, Ruby suggested commercial ties along the lines of the French relationship with the Indians. Well, his report was received in Mexico City, uh, discussed, and the result of it was the Spanish placed greater and greater emphasis on the San Antonio area for both missions and presidios or military outposts. And at the same time, they reduced missionary and mil military efforts elsewhere in Texas, according to Ruby's recommendations. Now, despite Spanish government's effort to withdraw from East Texas, Nagadoches turned out to be the second largest Spanish settlement in Texas because there's a lot of timber there, agriculture, and hunting. <clears throat> this is a, a reconstruction of what's called the Old Stone Fort, which was built in Nagadoches, um, in 1779. The fort was destroyed and Stephen F. Austin University um, sent a team of archaeologists and they put the pieces back together and they added some new construction. So you can go see that. It's on the campus of Stephen F. Austin uh, University. So now here we are. What's the result? Well, the Spanish, thanks to Ruby's recommendations, have really adopted the, what was the French policy of trade with the Indians for commercial reasons. Really not so much emphasis on converting the Indians to be Catholics. And this occurred in the 1780s and the 1790s. And indeed, the Spanish actually worked with French traders, who some of them still were in the, in the region, uh, to help the Spanish administer the areas of both huge Louisiana territory and Texas. Okay, thank you very much.